Welcome to The Myth of Motherhood, a podcast by, for, and about moms and those who love them. I don't believe in TMI, and this is a 100% judgment-free zone, because there is no one right way to be a mother. There is only your right way. I'm your host, Alyssa Alter, a Brooklyn-based mom, women's health expert, and motherhood advocate. Curious to learn more about what I do and why I do it? Visit alyssa-alter.com. All right, let's get this myth-busting party started. Holy smokes, am I excited about this conversation. I my, I mean, I think about this a lot. Like, what is my relationship to social media? What is the purpose of it? What is the benefit for me? What is the benefit for you? What is the benefit overall? Who am I benefiting by doing this? And I oftentimes in moments of frustration, which usually come from feeling like I need to like find the trending audio and do the, make the reel that everyone's supposed to be making. And I need to make this many reels and do all these things in frustration. I'll be like, I don't work for Instagram. And especially when I became a mom, when I first had Everett, and then a few months later when we went into lockdown, this became my lifeline to community, to people, to you, to people I already knew, to new friends, to myself, to the world. And I think we all know how easily that benefit can snowball and spiral into something else. And so in today's conversation, we're talking about momfluencer culture, what that is, what that looks like, the origin, the purpose, what it feels like to be momfluenced, which, I mean, you could be listening to this and be like, well, this is going to be a pretty negative episode. It's not all negative. This is just a real look at this very prevalent culture from a bunch of different angles. And we are talking to like the expert in momfluencer culture. So much so that her book is available for pre-order called Momfluenced. Yeah. She wrote a whole book about it because she has been observing this, studying it, learning about the studies happening in academia around influencer culture, around social media, and what this does to us and to mothers during a very vulnerable time in our lives. Because whether or not this is your first kid, your second kid, how big your community, your village is, having a kid becoming a parent for the first time, for the seventh time, whatever it is, it is a major upheaval and usually comes with a healthy side of existential crisis. So Sarah Peterson is incredible and she's written about feminism and motherhood for Harper's Bazaar, the New York Times, have you heard of it? The Washington Post, The Cut, and many other places. Her first book, Momfluenced, Inside the Maddening, Picture Perfect World of Mommy Influencer Culture, comes out in April of 2023. And like I said, it's available for pre order now. I'm going to include that link in the show notes. I'm making this real easy for you because this book is going to be so good. Okay, she also writes a newsletter, which I subscribe to, about momfluencer culture and the myth of the ideal mother. It's called In Pursuit of Clean Countertops. It's on Substack. The link to that is also in the show notes. And you can also follow Sarah on Instagram and Twitter. Her handle is at S. Louise Peterson. And I said it like I stressed the sen because it's S-E-N, not O-N. I feel like that's, you know, I'm doing that. That's how I talk about my first name. It's Alyssa with an I, A-L-I-S-S-A, because it's usually with a Y, but I spell it with an I. Um, which my mom just felt that she didn't like the way Y looked in the middle of the name. And it worked out in my benefit because was it, I don't know, was it seventh grade, eighth grade, somewhere around middle school, maybe it was younger for me, um, where it was like very cool to have like a nameplate necklace. It was the perfect excuse to get like a little diamond chip over the eye, which felt very, very important at that time. So that's a fun fact about me. And one last thing before we dive in today, I just want to thank you for being here. You have so many options of where to spend your time and thank you for choosing to spend some of it with me. It really means a lot. And I love hearing from you. If you like today's episode, if you like any of these episodes, 
rate, review, share with a friend, or shoot me a DM or an email. Let me know if there's something you want to hear about. If you have a response to something, I'm still doing the mini episodes. So if you have a question that you would like my answer to, if you have something you would like uh, some advice from a doctor of nothing, but a remarried divorcee, mother of one, soon to be two, um, perspective on, I would love to share that. And I hope sincerely that you enjoy today's conversation as much as I do. I have so many things I want to talk about and I know we'll get there. I just, I just, it's going to be great, but I feel like a great place for us to start is I want to hear from you in your words, with your perspective, your insights, your wisdom, everything. What is a momfluencer? Sure. So, I mean, the traditional definition is basically somebody who has monetized their maternal identity on social media. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've kind of expanded it for the purposes of my research and for the purposes of my book to essentially mean any mother on social media who is performing her motherhood in some way, regardless of whether or not she's uh, financially profiting off of it. So really it's any mom on social media because like we're a mom momming on social media. Right. I mean, and I, I kind of implicate myself in the book because essentially I want to draw attention to the fact that we're all performing motherhood all the time for various audiences so yes. yeah, so yes, we are. <laughs> Which so my next question was also like, to, you know, just to make these things like listen, when we hear momfluencer, we know what we're talking about, but we also have like our own spin on that. Which I'm not trying to erase that, but just for the p- purposes of this conversation to like clarify what we are talking about, level the playing field, so we're like all picking up what we're laying down. So. Um, we just went over what is a momfluencer. What is the role of a momfluencer? Um, so for those traditionally monetized accounts, it is to sell something, whether they're selling their identities, whether they're selling um, a product line, whether they're selling like women's retreats, whether they're selling a certain type of parenting technique, whether they're selling a nap dress, something is being <laughs> sold. Whether they're selling like a promise of a happier version of motherhood, something is being bought and sold. Well, yeah. And I mean, listen, I saw the new sequin nap dress. And for a moment, I thought maybe my my dreams too could come true. I didn't know there was a sequin nap dress. There's a sequin one now. And it almost got me. I, I though, like I really can't do a statement shoulder. Mm, mm -hmm, It doesn't, mm -hmm. it's not... It's not me. Right. It's just not me. As right. much as I, I as much as it, I think it's supposed to be, <laughs> I'm that demographic, right? Like right. it's supposed to be. So this is probably just another example of a way that I am failing as a parent. <laughs> totally. Um, it, it's, I also, it's not, I can't, I, I, it's not, it's, that's okay. Good for you. Not for me. Sure. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> I would also love, like, so that's the role of the momfluencer, but what about, like, the role of the momfluencers not monetizing? Like, what is the role of this when it's, I guess, just not monetized? Right, right. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes the non monetized accounts are almost more catnipy for me because. Because I find myself drawn to certain momfluencers for a number of reasons. Maybe it's what they're wearing. Maybe it's like how their hair looks. Maybe it's their photographic skills. Maybe it's because it looks like they're having fun with their kids when I'm not having fun with my kids. (laughs) And so I think what the non-monetized accounts are selling is sort of a, a little bit of hope and a little bit of aspiration in terms of like, oh, her motherhood looks like this maybe my motherhood could look like that if I did X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. So that's, and that gets really interesting and sometimes pernicious because I think it creeps into our subconsciousness in ways that we aren't always clocking and aren't always aware of. At least I know it has for me. Yeah. So that 
Exactly. And I think that's like really where the really sort of interesting conversation around this really exists is, is so like what, how, how is this momfluencer culture? How is this supporting moms? Cause it's not, it's also, it's not all bad. Totally. No. Right. Like there's a lot and everyone has like a great intention in this. That's like, this isn't just like trash talk in the real housewives. Like, oh God, no. Yeah. (laughs) Right. No. This is a very different, and I'm just making that explicit and you know, that like, this is not so like how, how does this culture support moms? It gives, like, I love what you just said. Like it does give some hope. Like maybe if I did try the course, go to the retreat, maybe for you, the sequin nap dress does this. Like I will then feel better myself and have more fun with my kids. What parent doesn't want that? Like what mom wouldn't love to infuse their life with more of that? Right. Um, But I'd love to hear you expand like on how this supports moms. I mean, I don't know... I mean, I go back and forth with this. On the one hand, like, there's nothing wrong with, like, seeking comfort in a quick hit of dopamine by means of, like, you know, aspirational scrolling pretty pictures and, like, clicking through links. Nothing wrong with that. I certainly do it. Duh. (laughs) How? (laughs) Right, right. Duh. I I guess, though, the other side is always, like, me buying a sequin nap dress or whatever. Sure, it's going to, like, give me a momentary little, like, hit of hit of hope, but really the only thing that's going to make lives significantly better for mothers is systemic change, right? And Mm -hmm. legislation and just massive reform to the systems that are controlling our lives. So on the one hand, it's like, yeah, there's nothing wrong with scrolling for aspiration and for shopping, but we also have to sort of recognize that that isn't, that those are little band-aids, right? That we need like right. a massive open heart surgery in terms of like <laughs> institutional motherhood. And like that's not gonna do it. Right. And that's I was also gonna ask you, and like in what ways is this momfluencer culture hurting moms? And it's also it's sort of like it's it's leading us down this road that's just still so disconnected and moving away from the actual problem. So it's band-aids versus like, if we're that disconnected from what the real issue is, none of our solutions are going to be accurate, are going to be all that impactful because they're not really addressing the root cause. Right. Well, and there are so many, so many mom um, And I think just there's becoming more and more, but activist mom fluencers, um, mom fluencers, championing specific causes. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it really, you really can like thoughtfully delib- uh, and deliberately curate your feed. Like if you are sort of like assessing who you're following and then asking yourself like, for what purposes? Like, yeah, it's fine. I'm following these five because I like their pretty pictures and I like their product recs. But it's yeah. also nice to follow moms that are like, advocating for paid leave and moms who are talking about gender and equity within the home. Um, moms talking about making domestic labor, like a respected and valued part of our lives and, you know, shining a light on the fact that it's invisible labor and it's unpaid labor. So there's so many different ways you can go. Yeah. <laughs> so that, cause, and I would love to hear from you. Like we've, we've talked a little bit about like, there's, the, the momfluencer culture and how that is a bit like experienced by the non momfluencers. Uh, but how, like what, what about amongst each other? What do you, what do you mean? Like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like, I guess like what is, Like this world where you're monetizing your motherhood experience online, right? And this is really isolated to social media, right? Although these, a lot of people have then a business associated with it, but this is really existing in this way. Um, 
how are these moms then relating to each other? The moms that are more promoting a cause for pro, um, initiating conversations around things that, and this is, you know, my favorite, the things we're not supposed to talk to talk about because we're supposed to just shut up and accept it and keep going and keep the status quo, right? Like mm-hmm. by, by talking about the value of work in the home, by talking about what the hell is this with the pay, with no paid leave, like this come. Seriously? Right. right. Seriously. Right. Seriously, we're doing this? You know, all of that. And then, I mean, is there a connection between them? Is there something going on? Is there a, re- like, what is the relationship between those mom influencers and the mom influencers who are selling me the away bag, the cheap flights and the getaways and the, that more aspirational lifestyle, which as we've talked about has benefits and also can then leave you scrolling and being like, I'm clearly doing something wrong because she's jet setting while other people are taking the helm and I haven't washed my hair and I can't tell if that's like formula or vomit in my hair. And like, I think I've been wearing these underpants for four days. Like I, that can't be good. Right. Right. And making you feel like, wow, I just kind of I can't do that. Like, right. do you know what I mean? And like, how is that culture <clears throat> existing? Um, I mean, I think it comes back to like you as the consumer having thoughtful dialogues with yourself. Um, I interviewed some psychologists and some mental health experts for the book and time and time again, the sort of central piece of wisdom was like constantly be checking in on yourself. Like, clock how much time you're spending on these accounts and really honestly assess whether or not you're getting tangible benefits from it. So if you're like, yeah, I spend two hours a week scrolling pretty pictures and occasionally clicking like, you know, on links to buy stuff and I'm fine with that, then Mm -hmm. cool. But if you're finding yourself like, I don't know, dreaming like i i have had i mean granted i was like mired in research but i've had like dreams about these mom influencers and i think that speaks to how like even though i know that everything online is a performance and we need to view it as filtered through like a lens of perform performativity i still i can't keep my subconscious from wondering like you know i really do think that that one woman's marriage is like bliss. And I really do think like, I don't know, her kid is a genius in a way. Like I, I do these subconscious beliefs about these people, these strangers that I will likely never meet creep in. And I do notice that it impacts my sense of self and really just takes up brain space and makes me less sort of sure and aware of my own maternal identity. I think in, I don't know in slightly troubling ways. Yeah. No, and what I'm... It's also like, I mean, the reality of motherhood is that it's like, it's all of the things, right? Right. Like it's, it's never like, and if you're looking at the account with only the beautiful pictures, like, you know, you like, we just have to know, like, we're only getting one slice of the pie. Like that is not the whole pie. Totally. And that a hundred percent. And it's like, I also understand for these mom influencers who are personal brands, right? This is their marketing. So, like, what are the ethics of, of that? Do you know I what mean, I mean? Because yeah. it's also like you want to, pro- you are providing a solution, but then if you're cutting out part of it, yeah, I mean, I don't really think it's on individual mom influencers to, I don't know, sort of educate consumers about like, you know, this is obviously just one slice of my life. Like, I think most of us are savvy enough to understand that by this point in like our social media age. Um, and I also think it's kind of futile to blame individuals for a system and an identity. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Like a hundred, a hundred percent. And I mean, it also goes along with like something I really believe is like, Every, every parent, every mom is doing her best. 
Totally. She is making her, her best decisions with what it, what information and resources are available in that moment. Like totally. I just absolutely everyone gets the benefit of the doubt because right. they, we are. Right. Um but it's just the evolution of this culture has become so it's thorny, yeah. yeah. And, I mean, and and we also can't blame these individuals for profiting off of an idealized image of motherhood that was in place well before any of us were even born, right? I mean, going back to like the cult of domesticity in the early 20th century, late 19th century, like we're playing, these mom pleasures are playing into an ideal that has existed and was created by men, essentially. Duh. And it's Shocker. Like, right, right. <laughs> and it's like, if they can make money from it, great, you know? Yeah. And how, when, when and how did you dive into this? Um, I think it was when my first kid was around two and my second kid was a newborn is when I first started, I think when I first discovered Taza, do you know Taza? Mm -hmm. Naomi Davis. My gosh. I, I just feel like everybody in the world knows her because she's just like <laughs> she's occupied so much of my like imagination for so long but she's like an og mommy blogger so like she okay. had a blog called uh was it love taza or i think yeah love taza and i feel she, like i have heard of that i bet you would i feel like you might recognize her she was huge and she's okay. been like mia on instagram for several months now and nobody knows what happened to her it's very mysterious uh -oh. Right, but is this like um, um? Oh my God, what's her name? What's her name? The wife of the guy who's in charge of Scientology, the wife who just oh, disappeared. I don't even know this. Oh, this that's, sounds juicy. That's good. That's good stuff. She's just gone, and they're like, what? she's away. Uh, mm. that's we really don't know creepy. what happened. It's <laughs> all we know about Scientology. Super Psychology. creepy because that's real culty. Like, yeah, like mom fluencers society. Can, like, this can have like a culty vibe. Like, that is a cult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we don't know what happened to Tessa. Okay. Yeah, but anyway, so sh her whole shtick was. She was in the Upper West Side raising, at the time, I think she had three kids. Now she has five. And her photos were beautiful. Her whole aesthetic was, like, bright and bold and sort of, like, unexpected. Um, like, she wasn't at all the all-beige everything and all-white everything mom influencer that we kind of, like, are familiar with now. Um, like, she had, like, adorable freckles. She was just, like, very adorable. And joy. Joy is, like, the big word when I think of her. Just she made everything look so fun, so joyful and playful and vibrant. And I found her when, yeah, had a toddler and a newborn. And I was just like, I cannot look away from this. Like, <laughs> I can't stop consuming this. And I think the big thing for me was that, like, motherhood has, you know, obviously there's deep joy to be found in motherhood. But it's not like a day-to-day -day fun thing for me, mm -mm. anyway. Like, mm -mm. it's, mm -mm. you know what I mean? No, so, no. It's like, <laughs> it's it's a lot. It's right. not that, though. No, no, it's not. It's like, I'm picturing being, like, dragged by, like, a tractor or sure. something. Like, just kind of, like. <laughs> like, relentless. Yeah. Yeah, like, by a big piece of machinery, so we're on, like, rough ground, and I'm just, like, bobbing along. <laughs> yes, totally. Totally. So, this was not that, and I was just like, what am I doing wrong? Like, what like, how can I have this version of motherhood? And I think another thing was that I had had expectations before having kids that that was what motherhood was supposed to be. Like joy and wonder and beauty at yeah, every corner. I don't think you're the only one who was no. sold that sack of shit. And yeah, so my central, you know, I guess, uh, curiosity, fascination, obsession stemmed from that, like squaring what I was consuming, this like joyful, beautiful, idyllic version of motherhood with what I was experiencing mm. and trying to sort of parse that out. Like, why are these two things so at odds? Is it me? And I just, yeah, I just kept 
thinking about it and obsessing about it. And yeah, that was, that was the seed, I guess. So then, so did that then spark the question of like, what's happening here? Like, what is this? Yes, yes, yes. And like, what is this doing to us? (laughs) And I love that. I love that. And then, and so you then like followed the fun and (laughs) here you are now, right? Like you've written a book, like if I'm not, I subscribe to your Substack. You okay. finished that final edits, right? Or yeah, 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 yeah. So, like, yeah. you've written yes this book, yeah, all about how this culture is affecting us, how we relate to it, and what what we need to do to manage our relationship with this, right? To understand that this is part of the picture and that it can support us, and if it's not supporting you. Pick a different one. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> totally, totally. Unfollow. Or, or totally. Totally, just like mute for right. a minute. <laughs> right. Right? It's everywhere. All the time, all at once. And it's been like, you know, several years now that we've all been mired in this. And I, it took sort of a while for people to start like looking around and critically examining it. I mean, academics have been studying it well before it hit the mainstream, but we've all Really? Been, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's been, yeah. That's incre- That's incredible for many reasons. One, <laughs> I just want to like, for you listening, like that's how impactful this is. That's how big this really is. Oh yeah. So, like really it like this, just take this moment to also like take a moment and be like, Hey, I'm going to check in on myself and my social media use and how that is showing up in the rest of my life. So like that, like, wow. And, and there are men in Congress who do not understand that an ectopic pregnancy cannot be moved from the fallopian tube and put back into the uterus. So I just also like we're getting lots of research on mom fluencers and still not a lot around just our health and our body. I just I just need I needed to say that. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Totally. I mean, I think it is a win if anything pertaining to motherhood is being studied at all, you know? A hundred percent. And this relates to our mental health and what's going on in our brains. And this is a huge thing that we need data. We need conversations. We need this information. Right. A hundred percent. Well, and I think it also directly connects to the lack of critical research being done on women's, you know, reproductive health. Like there's a huge, there's a huge subset of mom influencers who like trad, trad moms, trad wives. Do you know this term? No. I, oh, okay. Explain it. Okay. So trad, T-R-A-D, short for traditional. Ooh. And yeah, it's, it's a real, it's a real. I so, love it already. <laughs> <laughs> so like some of them are like, you would look at their accounts and it's like you've traveled back to, you know, 1886. They're wearing like homespun dresses. They live mm. totally self-sustaining lives. Mm, um, I'm picturing fresh baked pie. Yes, yes, yes. Fresh baked everything. All the beige. Everything. Um, yeah, and gingham. A lot of gingham and G- calico. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Fabulous. Yes. Okay. So there's okay. that type of trad mom influencer. And there's also the type that, you know, it's like living a modern life, but make sure her kids don't bother her husband when he comes home from work, make sure that her husband has a sandwich when he wants one, make sure mm, a that, hot meal, like correct, a hot correct. fresh meal. And like basically what aligns both, <laughs> both versions of a trad monfluencer is an adherence to the nuclear family and, um, traditional gender norms. So like the father and husband should be the leader and the wife should be submissive. A lot of them also hashtag their accounts like anti-feminism, pro-femininity. So. Wow. Yeah. Cause yeah. the first thing that came into my mind when you started describing this and I was like, Alyssa, keep your mouth shut until she finishes <laughs> because she's going to say really great things was just like the complete self-abandonment. Like you're yes. not, you're nowhere yes. near the top of the list No, because that fits that that those gender norms, that yeah. trad wife life. Right. And it's, it's quote, their choice to be led. So they sort of co-opt, you know, feminist ideology listen, in really listen, interesting there's, ways. there's also part of me that's like, 
listen, like maybe some things would be easier if I was just like, yeah, you know what? I'm not going to make any decisions. You just tell me what to do. Yeah. I'm just going to, you know, like yeah, I, I see that's that. That's the allure. That's the allure, I, right? I, Alyssa, can't, I, mm, not built for that. Well, no. And I mean, I just, I don't I, tell me what to do. No. Don't. And I think it's a pretty <laughs> objectively like harmful, you know, message to be spreading. But I guess especially I, given what we've seen right. is a result of that. Right. And that was my point is that, yeah. you know, the same time that like our reproductive rights are being completely demolished, you know, these accounts are rising to the surface and they're totally connected. Right. Because yes. Both side, both you know, entities want to return to a way of life that was never ideal or idyllic for anyone. Um, even arguably the white men in power, like it, you know, it wasn't great for anyone. Yeah, but yeah, that both both things are you know endorsing that way of life. Who are some of the other mom influencers I don't know about? And it doesn't have to be individual accounts, but like I didn't know about Trad Wife. Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. That's like, I didn't know it took, a, like, when I discovered um, free birthing. Oh, that yeah. That my mind. Well, that's I didn't know of, about that. Oh, well, that I would mean, be in a trad wife thing, because you're really yeah. going back. It's like, literally, yeah. like, we're we're mirroring Gilead. Like, we're going right. back to totally. sort of biblical yes. um, commandments and understanding and rules and, and, and models and way of life. So uh, if you don't know, listening free birthing is like you literally, you go out into the woods by yourself to give birth. Um, some people bring their partner. Um, some people don't and really just go by themselves and have transcendent experiences. This is something through, uh, listen, I, I'm not, I'm a doctor of nothing, but like, I know some <laughs> science things. So I have some I have a lot of questions and concerns and like there's statistics that make that really nerve wracking. And as someone whose baby got stuck, which is why I tore from stem to stern. And I, if I had done that, I absolutely would have died and hemorrhaged. Right. To de- Even if, if I could have gotten the baby out, I would have bled to death. Um, I, I don't, I don't under, I don't, there's some, like, I understand. <laughs> I don't under, I don't, un- I don't understand. I, well, my central, um, I guess, concern is not anybody's individual choice to birth how they want to birth, but my concern is that it's also idealizing the mother as innately capable of all things on her own and that she possess- possesses all the tools within herself and needs no external support, right? Which oh. directly connects to how we view mothers as capable, you know, of returning to work like a week after childbirth like yeah. all of these things are intertwined i'm yeah my brain just exploded and it made <laughs> me think about i actually read um your substack this morning with chelsea conaboy con i was like i'm not going to pronounce her yeah. I, on the first try i'm not conaboy yeah um about these the assumptions of motherly instinct motherly intuition and how they come from yes that in the process of matrescence like our our brain chemistry our brain structure uh changes yeah yet this idea that we uh, the way i describe it is like basically download the manual and have all the answers spontaneously right is harmful and it perpetuates this idea that we as women you don't need to help us. We can do absolutely everything on our own. And it's that pressure that is crushing us. Yeah. It is crushing us. And it's then if you've internalized that your entire life and you're already not asking for help. And then when you're scrolling social media in the middle of the night, when you're up in the middle of the night feeding your baby, cause you're doing it because no one else is doing it because you're a woman and you can do this no matter what. And asking for help is a sign of weakness or you're somehow deficient. So you're yeah. doing it by yourself and you're scrolling and maybe all that you see are those aspirational accounts, which are meant to fill you with hope and yeah. bring a little joy are now further crushing you because you're so far away from it. Like yeah. we see how this snowballs right. into, I don't know the right word for it into just like, I mean, it's disaster, it, right? And it and it's the experience of being gaslit. You know, oh. you're fed this myth that motherhood should not only come naturally to you, but should uphold uh, uphold your identity. 
fulfill you in every you way. Happy, all right. slices of the pie, even though we're <laughs> only showing you one, all of those other slices too. Right, right, right. And at the same time, you're dealing with new motherhood, which is just a profoundly um, emotional and physical experience of upheaval. There's no way around it. There's no way you can go through early motherhood without experiencing some sort of existential, you know, crisis. It literally, it like takes all of your stuff and like just dumps it out in front of, yep. front of the table. Um, in my first podcast, I actually called Myth of Motherhood. I had a guest who talked about how becoming a mother was like, every day walking through your own personal house of horrors. Oh God, so just yes. like all of your stuff is there and it's just like you open a door and you're like, which one's it going to be? Like yes. what's going to jump out this time? Cause it'll be something mm -hmm. now. Uh, what you just said made me think of something that then I was like, Oh, that is really interesting. Is that this, this whole trajectory for you, the uh, catalyst for it happened after you had your second, because I think we also have so much conversation around this when we first become mothers and then there's sort of even less what the impact is after subsequent children right but we i mean we definitely we see it everywhere like when someone's pregnant for the second time like people will literally be like oh well you've done this before and right it's like, i <laughs> actually have never been pregnant for the <laughs> It could be your second time. That could actually be your seventh pregnancy right. and potentially your second baby. You don't know what the hell anyone's been through. Right. But like, I've actually never been pregnant with another kid or I've never been pregnant with two other kids. Like, actually, no, this is the first time and it's filled with its own insanity. Yeah. And so, I don't know. I would love to hear something about that, like how this happened after your second and that continued shift becoming a new mom again. Yeah, I mean, some of it was just like the luck of timing because I had my first kid in 2012. And so, you know, Instagram was only two years old at that point. Oh, we were still just posting still shots with like those cutie filters. Yes. So, like, it, it, <laughs> it, yes, it was like a time it was of so different. Yes. Yeah, it really was just like a totally a scra It was scrapbooking online. Yes. And mom's monsters simply did not exist the way they do now. And they didn't exist when I had my second in 2014. Um, but I guess my point is, yeah, I had crippling postpartum depression with my first. And if mom's monster had culture had existed the way it does now in 2012, I can't even fathom how much worse it would have been. It was, I, I remember one Facebook post because like Facebook was the primary platform that yep. everyone was on in 2012. One just Facebook post that was like a newborn baby photo. And the like caption was something like, you know, welcome baby Emma. We can't, uh, remember life without you. And I was just like, how can you not remember life without her? Because like life without babies was for me in that moment, like hadn't been treated for postpartum depression yet was like crying right. every day, which is like life without a baby was bliss. It was better. Yes, it was better. <laughs> it was better. It was than better. <laughs> yes. So like that yes. was also, one thing. Oh also, how can you not remember? It was like four days ago. I know. Like, I know. I know. <laughs> but it's just like, my but point yes. is it was one solitary Facebook post and it crushed me. So had it mom cleanser culture existed then, I mean, it just would have been so much, so much worse. And yeah. And, and I didn't experience postpartum depression with my second kid and was like thoroughly jaded on motherhood by that point, which is why <laughs> I think I... I don't think, I think my fascination with Taza and those earlier mom bloggers was more just like, no, like I know motherhood isn't a walk in the park. Like you I know the that. space to be fascinated by yes. it and curious rather yes. than consumed by it because you were also more established in right. your experience of it and centered in you in motherhood, which that's the part that we're now having when you're a new mom and you're at your most vulnerable and you haven't had an opportunity to find your center in that yeah. you're being inundated with information from all over that I know like, Oh yeah. Enjoy every moment. Oh, God. How? I know. How? And, and why? Why? <laughs> like... well, oh, yeah, but also like which, and I say this like, uh, I, I'm obsessed with my husband. I really, uh, not only do I love him, like, I really like him. He's so great, right? And not all the time, 
Right. <laughs> right. Like, that all the time. Right. <laughs> right. It, nothing in life is ever like that every single no. moment. And when you're a mom, it absolutely isn't. Right. right. What it is is that those moments that are really great, they're like so powerful that the fact that they happen once <laughs> in a while yeah. somehow ba- creates some semblance of balance to the rest of the shit show. Yeah. Totally. Which is really absolutely incredible. We should get NASA on it. This is like <laughs> this is like black hole level metaphysics. Yeah, for like, sure. <laughs> that's Completely. the magnitude of it. <laughs> because it just doesn't. And why? Yeah, why is it? Why aren't we supposed to say that in your research and everything that you've you've learned through that and your conversations with people and also your lived experience as a mom being influenced all over the place, you know, sequin nap dress and all. <laughs> um, now that we've talked about it, I don't know, your phone can probably hear us. It's going to come up. Oh, totally. Um, like how, what, what do we do? <laughs> how do we like, you know what I mean? Like I, I find this like, I mean, all of this is so interesting. And even just speaking about this, I think we'll all look at our phones and look at the accounts a little bit differently. And I think we all really already are the awareness around like this is a curated thing, you know? Yeah. But what do we do with this? Like, how do we proceed? Yeah. I mean, the more I understand about how we got here and how that like the idealization and profound lack of support of mothers have always gone hand in hand, particularly for marginalized mothers. And it's it's still happening. I mean, it's been happening, it's still happening. And the more I understand that like mothers are really disenfranchised and they have been deliberately Mm -hmm. for explicit reasons, the more this whole myth of the ideal mother and the ideal mothering experience has less power over me because it's just the more you know the more it's patently absurd and the more clearly visible the bullshit is yeah and it's, it's sort of like once you get that and once you know you're just so much more empowered to you know, look at a diaper bag that somebody's trying to sell you because it's the only diaper bag you'll ever need and it's going to make your busy lifestyle so much more streamlined. And you're just going to be able to be like, no, it's just a fucking bag. I can use a fucking tote to carry diapers it's, and wipes in. It's just a fucking like, bag. And honestly, there are too many pockets. I'm going to put these yeah. away. I'm not going to know which pocket it is. And totally. now I'm going to spend all my time being like, which pocket? Totally. And checking 65 pockets, still not finding the pacifier that we desperately need. Right. Yeah. And just the more you're going to look at the pretty pictures and, you know, that's a pretty picture. Like I could take a pretty picture too, if I, you know, had the professional professional photographer, if it was the golden hour, if my babies weren't crying, if somebody gave me a dress and so I could spawn con it, like we can all take pretty pictures if we really want to. That does not make our lived experience of mothering any different. The only thing that will make our lived experiences of mothering different is systemic change. Yeah. And it, by really learning about this so that like, I mean, knowledge is power by really learning about this so that we can see through this lens, uh, this educated lens and make our best decisions, right? Which for all of us are going to be more educated at this point. Yeah. That's going to allow us to see more clearly. And like we said before, like, instead of being led down a different road, see those real sources, what's happening, how these relate, and then go towards solutions that are actually accurate and go move towards the root cause of the problem, which are these systemic inequities, deeply ingrained, integrated systems and beliefs that are hurting us. Right. Right. And it's, and it's really freeing to be like, it's not me. It's, systemic racism it's systemic sexism Mm -hmm. it's systemic ableism it's systemic capitalism it's all of these massive power structures that i'm supposed to exist within 
that's what's making my life difficult. Not no the wonder fact. it feels uncomfortable. Right. No wonder. Right? Of course We've it sho- does. We've been shoved into this small little place in the middle of a mess. Yes. Yeah. And that's why we don't feel good. And that's why we need to, we have a lot of things, a lot of options of things we can do. One of which is pre-ordering your book, which, <laughs> you know, I'm going to do. Please do. <laughs> um, and so that we can actually be empowered with information so that we can advocate for ourselves and each other. Sarah, thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for writing this book. Thank you for your Substack. I personally love it and I recommend it to everyone. I recommend it on my Substack. Like people check it out and pre-order Momfluencer. Momfluenced. <laughs> yes. Cuz we've all we've all been right. <laughs> and and we do have a say in what we do about it and what we do with it. Yeah. And I just, yeah, no, it'll be, the book obviously is going to be so fun because of who you are and the way you write. And this is like, this is important stuff. This is big stuff. And we deserve to have this for ourselves, for each other, and for the women and all children that come after us. Yeah. Mm. Is there anything else? (laughs) Okay. We're going to order your book. We're going to subscribe to your sub stack. Um, Where else can we find you? Um, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at S Louise Peterson with an E mm, and I will <laughs> include that Peterson's in the show notes. Have an o. So I always say not this e. one. No, not no. this one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so Thank much again, you, Sarah. Alyssa. Thank you so much for sharing your precious time with me. I am so happy that you're here. I hope this episode resonated with you and maybe even inspired some insight into the myth of motherhood and how that shows up for you in your life. If you found yourself nodding your head along with this episode thinking, oh my God, did Alyssa read my journal? Or I feel so seen. Or even I'll have what she's having. You can. Check out our incredible community over in the private Facebook group, Moms Club, and visit me at alyssa-alter.com to download your free guide to the 20 things no one tells you about pregnancy and postpartum. Remember, there is no one right way to be a mother. There is only your right way. See you next week.